Hi, I'm Alex and welcome back to Dreams of Green. So today I wanted to give you a little bit of an update on our large scale food forest in the front paddock. Um, so as you can see behind me, we're here on our 10 acre property just outside of Kyogle in northern New South Wales, Australia. And because we've got a beautiful, mild, overcast day and it's spring and the risk of frost has passed, um, we've been out in the paddock busy mowing um, and getting rid of all this excess grass. So I wanted to just show you the techniques we've used when planting a food forest on a much larger scale where we've been able to have a big experiment plant things into the ground, timing everything with the rains, and just find out what are our natural pioneers that are going to grow quickly and kickstart this food forest system with really fast growing shade um, and an ability to be pruned heavily to create that much needed mulch. So our goal here is basically to turn a degraded cow pasture into a lush, thriving, food forest ecosystem that's not only a haven for wildlife and birds um, but something that's also going to provide food and a long-term source of timber for ourselves as well. So I'll take you through a closer look and show you the techniques we've used and also I'm going to outline what has been the biggest threat to our food forest which is definitely not what I expected. All right let's take a closer look. So you can see here we've got several rows of food forest species and they're all planted on contour on this south southwest facing slope. Um, so as I go through I'm going to show you exactly what we've done just to give those trees that extra bit of protection during the winter months. So as I mentioned it's spring now the risk of frost is over and you can see we are dealing with exceptionally thick soteria grass here which creates fantastic mulch but we don't want to let that get too thick which is what's starting to happen now and strangle out the trees. So you can see here this is an avocado seedling that's been thriving. Um, we've been able to protect it with this long soteria grass around it so that it didn't get affected by frost. Um, what I've done as well is I've just made sure as I walk along these tree rows I've planted things every metre. So you can see here we've got an avocado tree which is one of our target species that's going to provide um, a great source of avocados in the future. And then next to it we've got a nitrogen fixing tipu and you can see that even though that is surrounded by this really long thick soteria grass it's popped out of the soteria grass and is now thriving. So this will be a great way of converting these grass paddocks into a forest system. So you can see these rows that are green, they're full of bees and clover, everything's super lush. So this is what we maintain with the ride on mower. And now we're getting in and basically pruning all of this with the brush cutter to get in nice and close to those trees and free them up a bit. So the other thing that we've protected here, this is a blue quandong. Now, if I planted this out in the paddock without any protection, then it would have died because of the frost. Now you can see as well that spacing is really important. So as I go along with the brush cutter and start finding all the trees, I know where to look because as I walk along the tree row, I've got the tipu here, and then a metre across I know to look out for my next species which is a blue quandong. So this is a native rainforest tree, a long term timber species as well and it provides a great dappled canopy. So I wanted to incorporate just a mixture of um, some support trees such as the tipu tree here and you can see the big rock stars have been our um, native acacias. So these are acacia fimbriata and they've really gotten up to provide some great um, canopy. And also it's approaching the wet season in a couple of months. So these will need to be pruned um, just to help have all of that beautiful nitrogen uh, rich mulch break down and feed the fruit trees underneath. So as we walk through you can see here just how thick the grass is, but I know as I step through that I'm expecting a tree in a metre. So another great 
reason I've done this is just to work out what are our natural pioneers and which ones can be planted at a later date once we've got an established canopy. So you can see here, this is a Leucina. This has managed to thrive even though it's surrounded by this thick grass. So we're starting to learn that the avocado seedlings have actually coped as long as they've got some protection from frost. The Leucina's doing well. You can see how thick this grass is. So this is well overdue for a prune, but in here, I'm going to try and get the camera in so you can see. Under there, you can see the green leaves. That's actually a macadamia. Now, any macadamias I planted that were exposed to the elements, they burnt, basically. So now I've cleared some of that grass away. You can see this baby macadamia that's actually thrived underneath the basket I've made with this thick soteria grass. So that's been protected from the frosts. We just have mild frosts here. So a couple of mild frosts over winter. And we also had a crazy heat wave at the end of August, which obviously should be our winter time, where it hit over 40 degrees, which is basically as hot as it gets in, in the middle of summer. So that's been nicely protected, but it's definitely going to pre appreciate reducing the competition from this grass. And as I trim all this grass away, that'll produce beautiful mulch to keep in the moisture. So timing is um, quite important too. The reason we're clearing these grass rows is we're expecting a big rain event starting pretty much this afternoon. So I want to clear all this grass away so that the trees underneath can get a really good soak. And then we can see where the gaps are as well. We can work out what's been a success, what hasn't thrived, and basically plant more of what's working and trial other things as well. So you can see, this is a great example. This bit, the stick there that you can see, that there has been, succumbed to a little bit of frost, but you can see the bits protected are now re-sprouting. So again, this avocado is really going to love getting some of that grass away. So we'll continue mowing. So luckily we've just got this row to go here, the last bit of this row, and we've got a bit more of this row to go as well. So as I show you the rest of the food forest, you can see if I can zoom in a bit, The wallabies are absolutely loving just relaxing in the tree rows under the shade of the acacias, which is really beautiful to see. And you can see the bird, the willy wagtail in the background there. So this really is just creating this absolute haven for wildlife, which is absolutely such a delight to walk through the tree rows and be able to see all of this biodiversity. Okay, so now we're going to get into some mowing and I'll show you the results after we've cleared all this grass and we can have a look at what's been really successful and what just hasn't worked for us. So this is a great example of just an experiment. This is an Australian teak, and this has been in the ground, I think just under two years, and it's done nothing. Um, however, our red cedar that we planted up on the back hill have powered along. And so what I'm going to do is, um, I, want, I really wanted to have Australian teak, but it's just not performing in our heavy clay soil. Um, so what I'm going to do is replace the Australian teak with another Australian native um, red cedar, and it's also a useful timber as well. Um, here's another example too. I cleared, this is a native current. So you can see what's happened is um, this native current, sorry, just put these here. I uh, cleared the grass prematurely before the heat wave, and you can see the effect that the exposure to the sun has had. So this was lush and green with that canopy of the grass and having that exposure to the sun 
you can see how the leaves are a bit burnt. I mean, these are quite tough, it'll bounce back, um, but that's just a reason why we've had this shade. So a big strategy now is going to basically be planting um, a heap more pigeon pea and acacia, um, our tephrosia, which I've pointed out in previous videos, which has been a really fast growing pioneer species. And we've discovered a calyandra as well. And I got seed from um, Zaytuna Farm um, Zaytuna permaculture farm and that has been an absolute standout pioneer as well. So again we've just looked at this as just a giant experiment. There's no been no irrigation, no care. This, these rows I haven't touched in probably close to 18 months at least. Um, so it's a great way of just seeing what thrives by itself basically. And another way um, I've chosen some of the pioneers is just seeing what naturally pops up in the paddocks that can compete with this grass. So obviously um, if we pan across um, in some of these rows lower down, we've actually got some eucalypts, which will be great chop and drop. And another one that naturally popped up in the paddocks is this Grevillea silky oak. So this grows um, very, very easily. We get a lot of seed blowing over from the mature trees across the road that are along the creek line there. And this tends to pop up in the paddock. So that was a great one to use as a natural pioneer. And you can see it's competing with this grass, no problem, but it's really going to appreciate clearing that grass. Um, it's been competing with the roots as well of that satiria grass. So like um, in a forest, when, you, uh, when a tree falls down and all, all of a sudden there's light and less competition, it's like the trees just shoot up towards the light. So I'm hoping trying to mimic those natural systems, that's what's going to happen here as well. Um, and the Grevillea silky oaks used overseas too to shade things like coffee plantations and also provide a long-term so long source of useful timber as well. So we'll keep mowing and hopefully we'll be finished in uh, an hour or so. Okay, so we've cleared up these rows. These young trees should be a lot happier now without all this competition from the grass. They can finally breathe. So we've had some good success here. We've got a bush lemon here. They grow naturally on the side of the road. We've got another tipu, which they've really started to shoot up. And a big surprise was the custard apples. So we've got a custard apple here, which is doing quite well. I thought they would be a little bit too sensitive, to be honest, but over the winter, it's been completely covered um, in a grass basket just to protect it from the frost. And as we showed you earlier, we've got the silky oaks, some leucina, and a few other support trees and fruit trees dotted in between. Now, as we go down to the next row, so what we've got is, we've got the magpies too. The magpies love coming in after we've mown because they tend to get all of the bugs 
So as we come down, you can see we've had a few storms come through. So one of the disadvantages of the Acacia fimbriata, as you can see here, the growth is just extraordinary, but they do tend to split when we get storms. So you can see we've had to prune that back hard. We have lost a couple of them, but again, they're more sacrificial or support trees. So underneath here, you can see we've got an ice cream bean. Now this was the first indication that something was wrong because you can see the size of this ice cream bean here. What was happening is they were starting to fall down in the rows like dominoes and it was just the ice cream bean. Anyway, we didn't realize, very sadly, um, a few months back we lost our 18 year old cat and what's happened is our cat was great at catching rabbits, rats and mice. What we noticed was when we were mowing, we had rats and mice scattering everywhere. So even though these grass baskets, you can see I've left a couple just to protect some really small trees. So they've been great to shelter the trees, but they've also created a perfect haven for rats and mice. And trees this big and bigger what happens is they, this one we've propped back up, they start to dig in the roots and eat the roots. You can see they've, we've filled this one back in, but they tunnel, they make really big tunnels. And these trees were just falling one after another in the tree rows. Then the next thing to fall was the pecans. So in the next row down, so I've been starting to replant this row. So we've got things like the locut, which is doing really, really well. The strawberry guava is tough as nails and they have survived as well. So I'm going to just try and find where I've got a pecan hole. So here's a great example. This, here's my hand, look at the size of that hole. So it may be bandicoots as well. Um, and basically they've tunneled in. And what I found was just a series of sticks standing up in the holes they chewed right through the base. So this had been a can um, that I'd used on a stake to mark where I'd planted the trees. You can see the size of that hole, unbelievable. So first it was the ice cream bean to go. You can see we've tried to rescue a couple, um, but I'll probably replant and see what happens. And the next to go were the pecan trees. And then sadly in another row further down, we've got some mangoes as well. And I only planted mangoes probably six months ago and they've come in and eaten all of those as well. So unfortunately, as I said, because we had the cat, he managed to keep the rat and mice population as well as the rabbit population under control and since we've lost the cat not only have we lost a lot of trees from vermin but very sadly two weeks after the cat died a fox came in and took all of our chickens as well but I'll make another video about that and show you um, how we converted the chicken coop into a thriving veggie patch. So this is just panning across just to show you the food forest. So the advantages as well, we've worked out what the rats don't like to eat. So, so far all the natives have done really, really well. So that's a great indication we can continue planting more natives because they seem to um, not attract any rodents. And the other thing that have done really well is if I come up to this row, so here's one of the few remaining ice cream bean. <laughs> um, next to it, we've got a guava. So they haven't eaten any of the guavas. You can see here we had um, mango. So all we had left were just holes where they've taken, dug down, eaten the roots and left the tree. So a lot of gaps to fill in, but that's why I'm very happy. I've got a home-based nursery as well 
because any trees that haven't worked, we've got thousands of trees in the home base nursery, so it doesn't actually cost us anything to replace the ones that haven't worked. So another thing that's been great is the Fajoa. So the Fajoas have not been affected. And what else have we got here? Um, the mulberries as well. These have just been recently planted and they don't like to um, dig up the mulberries either. So that's been another great one. So slowly but surely, we will discover what works, what doesn't, but it's going to be very interesting to see. Now we've gotten rid of the homes for the rats and mice. Um, when I replant after these rains come and the soil's nice and soft, it'll be just really interesting to see if we still have that problem now that they're not going to have all of this cover. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out as well is with all this beautiful grass and now having the trees, look what the birds are doing. So I've had so many birds nesting in these young trees and it's just really beautiful to see. So there you have it. There's a little update of what we're doing with the food forest this spring and how things have progressed. And if you have any suggestions whatsoever, if you yourself have had to deal with vermin or even um, bandicoots digging up your trees, eating the roots, please let me know in the comments. Obviously, I'm not a fan of poison, so I'm not going to be poisoning anything. Um, we have a lot of um, magpies and crows and things that also eat um, vermin, so I don't want to use any poison. So I'm just looking for an organic uh, solution. As I said, just removing the grass, that may work. If not, I'm going to try things like maybe cayenne pepper and things like that um, that might really deter them once they dig down. So we'll see how it goes and I will keep you posted. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the next one.